Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the um, second meeting of the Bath Area Forum. Uh, my name is uh, Dave Dixon. I am the Community Engagement Manager for Bath and North East Somerset Council. Uh, I'm joined this evening by uh, Mark Hayward. Mark Hayward is uh, one of the uh, Community Engagement Project Officers, and he will be doing the IT, and he will also be assisting me uh, with some of the questions and answers which can come out in the in the chat. We've had some questions that have been uh, submitted already, um, and that will be we will go through with them, and those will be questions for Phil. If um, there are a couple of things that I do need to tell you. One is that um, this meeting will actually be recorded. Uh, and the second thing is that obviously once it is recorded, a copy of it will go on to the council's uh, YouTube website. And so it can be viewed by people at a later date. If you so the meeting is scheduled for an hour and a half to finish at half past seven. I am determined that it will finish by half past seven because I know we're all busy people. We've got other things that we need to be doing. And I do thank you all for coming and giving your time for this evening to come and listen to these presentations. One will be about WECA transport planning, which will be done by Phil Wright. Uh, and then the second one will be a local plan partial update with some of the supplementary planning documents, which will be done by uh, Richard Dayone tonight. And um, it's come in to stand in for Karoon, which is brilliant. So basically what will, how it will work is that they will be a, a small 15 minutes or so presentation, and then there will be 10 minutes or so to allow you to ask any questions. I've already got some questions about the first presentation. If anybody's got anything as we go along, please put it into the chat and Mark and I will pick it up and then we will be able to ask Phil. So Phil, I understand uh, if you're ready, you've got... Well, well Mark's sorting the... Uh... IT out. I'll introduce myself. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you a lot for inviting me along tonight and uh, giving you a chance to come and present. Um, as as uh, uh, as the Chair has said, I'm, I'm Phil Wright. I'm uh, the Public Transport Programme Manager in the West of England Combined Authority. Um, I'm also a resident who lives along the A4 corridor between Bristol and Bath. I, I, I live in Brislington, but I um, travel regularly along the corridor by foot, bike, bus, car, you name it. I think I've travelled along the corridor. Um, both of my daughters uh, go to Hayesfield, go, go to school in, in Bath. Um, so they travel daily on the bus. Um, my youngest has just started and I've got to go along to uh, parents induction evening tomorrow evening um, to, go, to go along. And so I'll be travelling along at rush hour and, and getting the flavour for that again. Um, uh, I'm, I'm also a regular visitor to Twerton Park to go and watch Bath City as well. Um, it's my, my, my local team. So uh, hopefully a level of reassurance that I do understand uh, the, the, the issues that uh, you, you may have when you travel on the corridor, because I do it myself on a, on a virtually daily basis. Um, if you can skim down to the second slide, Mark. Um, so I guess I just wanted to set the context for what we are trying to achieve along this corridor. Um, it's about how do we provide options for people when they travel along this corridor and it's around sustainable transport options and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail during the presentation as to why that is our main focus. Um, it really is about trying to give people options to help them to move around more easily. I think we are very comfortable with the fact that people have to use a, a, a private car for, for journeys and that's fine, but it's ensuring that we can give people options to try and encourage them to not to use the private car for vehicle journeys they could have made by other means and, and give them better options than they currently have um, when they travel along this corridor. Um, clearly congestion is an issue and I think uh, I don't need to spell that out and talk about that in any detail, uh, but obviously that links to carbon emissions, um, uh, a poor quality of environment where, where people live, uh, where we work and travel. Um, climate emergence is obviously a big issue that we are trying to address with this as well. And I say, it's just trying to encourage people to leave their cars at home for journeys they could have made by means other than, than driving. Um, I think setting a wider context as well is this, that we're not just looking at this corridor. There's a, there's a wider program going on here, which is phased and is likely to take in the region of 10 years to deliver, um, if I was being realistic. Um, we are working on other corridors at the moment. There's some of them um, cherry picked there. I think probably of greatest interest to you probably is the, the A37, A367 corridor, which will include links into, into Bath. Uh, but we're looking at those links from the Summer Valley um, in, into both Bath and Bristol as well. Um, and the connections that come in there. Um, so I may well come back to talk to you about that at, at some later stage, because we're hopefully going to be starting uh, our engagement work on, on that very shortly. 
Um, yeah, do you want to skip down more to the to the map if you can? So I guess this is just to give that context. So we are looking uh, end to end here. We're looking at uh, primarily we're looking at the connection uh, from from central Bristol. We are uh, because of the technical detail of other projects that are happening in Bristol. It's primarily from the Three Lamps Junction in Bristol, which you should know hopefully very well, uh, taking you all the way into uh, the, the, the into central Bath uh, at one end, obviously via. Some of the key interchanges there, such as Hicks Gate, um, the, the, along the Cainshin Bypass, uh, the, the Globe Roundabout, um, and picking up communities such as Cainshin Saltford, um, and then through into into uh, the urban bath area. Um, we've we've tried to keep it as flexible as we can on that map because we are at the very early stage of development of this project, and that's why we're here today, and that's why we're out to engagement at the moment is to hopefully get you to help us to shape it. Um, there's an opportunity for you to, to help us to shape it. Um, yeah, if you skim down, please move to the next slide. The principle for me and the principle that I've got through all of these projects is how do we make it easier? I think I think we can all accept at the moment it is easier for you to walk out of your house and jump in the car and drive. Um, and I think it's how do we make it easier for people to make other choices? How do we make it easier for people to get a better bus service? How do we make it easier for people to walk in a nicer environment? How do we make it easier for people to jump on a bike and cycle in a, uh, in a way that, that, you know, that doesn't frighten them and scare them by being on busy roads? Um, ultimately, we want to try and get better, more frequent bus services along this corridor. The, the, the A4 corridor is actually quite well provisioned with the, with the X39, certainly the end-to-end -end service, but the connections in and around it are, aren't particularly great. So how can we drive that usage level up so that we can get better services along the corridor, but also better connections into and around the corridor as well? Um, it really is about trying to give that priority to the buses so that they have that more guaranteed journey time. And, and from that, we can hopefully drive that provision upwards from there and also hopefully reduce fares as part of that. There's a, there's a mechanism um, that we are currently working on um, called Enhanced Partnerships, which is where we, and I say we, um, the local authorities and the combined authority, deliver improved infrastructure to make the bus network run more efficiently. And as part of that, we get a deal from the operators to uh, provide more services, uh, more frequent services, uh, reduce prices, et cetera. So that will be something we'll, de we'll be developing in partnership with the, with the operators at the same time. Um, Obviously, part of this as well is that trying to, to work and encourage regeneration and economic growth. Um, we've, we're, I think we're all aware of there are areas along this corridor which aren't particularly great environments at the moment and would, would I think it would be very helpful if we could encourage the regeneration of, of those areas. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. So really, this is just talking about some of the issues and I, I, I'm probably, um, uh, teaching my grandmother to suck eggs here, because I think you probably all know these if you live on or adjacent or travel along this corridor. Um, huge reliance on cars on the A4 and, and heavily congested, certainly in some of the key sections down there. The section I, I live in, Brislington, is seems to be almost constantly congested. Um, obviously, the, what comes with that is the air quality issues. Um, there are limited walking and cycling provision down there, but it's certainly, as somebody who Saturday cycled from Brislington to Twerton Park. I uh, had to take convoluted routes that took me off the corridor and up and down hills and um, on shared use pavements. Uh, and, and it wasn't necessarily the best environment for that. Uh, the park and ride sites at both ends were oversubscribed pre-COVID. Uh, pre um, I'm sure that they will head rapidly back up towards that again now that some level of normality, thank God, is starting to, to return. Um, and bus journeys themselves are lengthy and they are quite often longer than the taking the car so it doesn't encourage necessarily people to think about not using the car um i think we're also aware as well this route is a, a critical route connecting those local communities um, along the route when i talk about um end-to-end -end cycling provision i get a lot of people saying well who who would cycle and do, and do that cycle from end to end it's not necessarily about people doing that end-to-end -end route it's people about connecting communities between the route one good example i know of and see on a regular basis is uh, that the, the fairly high number of school children who walk and cycle between saltford and uh, wellsway school in canesham um, i think that's a really good example of where there is a reasonable level of provision but obviously would hopefully we can make that a lot better 
um, and give those school children an opportunity to, to do that connection between Salford and Keynesham. Next slide, please, please, Mark. So what are we doing? This is very early stages of um, the development of the scheme. Um, so we want you to tell us about your issues. Um, we are going through what's called an options assessment at the moment. So we are considering options for what we could do, and what we could deliver along this corridor. Um, we can do that. And I, I, I can do it probably a little bit better than some of my colleagues because I live on, on this corridor. But you who are users and people who travel along the corridor, we need your input. We need you to tell us about your issues to make sure that later on in the project, when we come back with uh, designs for solutions, we've built in those issues that you've told us about early on. Um, I've delivered projects for, 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 for a long time. Um, and certainly in the old days, we used to think we knew better as officers and we would bring designs and put them in front of the public and, um, and would uh, quite often get a proverbial kicking at that point because we hadn't considered the options that the residents felt were the issues. So this is about trying to make sure we don't do that, don't make those same mistakes and we, we have your input at an early stage. Now you'll notice the time scale there is quite tight. Unfortunately, I couldn't get to come to this meeting till quite close to the end of the uh, uh, the engagement period. Um, so it's running till Friday, this Friday. Um, and we we are, what we've got, we've got a survey on there. So we're asking you questions about how you currently use the corridor and then what you would like to see improved along that corridor. Um, we've also got a map as well, where you can go and drop a point on a map and tell us about a specific issue on a specific location. And I really should stress, it can be as big as um, the whole corridor. It can talk about a specific crossing that is a problem or is missing or, or whatever it may be. Um, we are looking for that wide range of, of issues. And the, and the next slide, please, um, Mark. So just to give you, I guess, the, 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 there's some links here which take you to the to the website. Um, it's very easy to find on the Travel West website. Um, and I would encourage you to, to do that and hopefully tell your friends and uh, colleagues about it. I appreciate there's only a couple of days left. But the more information we can harvest at this stage, hopefully the better project we can make. Um, we are aiming to, to, to the next timescales, we're aiming to publish this as part of the engagement report later this year. Um, we are delivering at the moment a, we have to go through a stage process when building a scheme called a business case. So this is where at the, what's called the strategic outline business case. So the very high level at this point. Um, we're aiming to submit that to approval by the Combined Authorities Joint Committee in, in January. So we have to commit submit that in late, Janu late November. The next stage of the project will boil that down into what's called the outline business case, which is where we'll go through that design process and put that back in front of you again and get some comments again and take that away and refine it and ensure that we're still uh, that the, the important thing as far as the government concerned is we're showing value for money that we will what we are intending to do will improve everybody's lives ultimately. Um, so that's going to happen during 2022 and we'll be looking to submit that in late 22 and then <clears throat> sorry excuse me and in 23 we would have to do the full business case which would be the final section which is not a particularly lengthy process because most of the legwork would have happened by there um, but it's doing the financials and we would aim to submit that in uh, mid to late 23 um the, the the way i've talked about this project is that i would like to see proverbially first spade in the ground late 23 um to, to start that construction um so it, it may it may not be the, the the big chunky junctions at late 23 but that will follow in 24 onwards um and i think that's about it from my point of view um and i'm guess i'm open to any questions anybody may have at this point phil i've got um, some questions that were uh, submitted beforehand um and i believe the people that submitted those questions are actually are actually here so i was just wondering whether or not they get an opportunity to ask the question themselves so i'm just thinking so there were there were three questions from uh, robin Kerr. robin one of them obviously was about cleveland bridge which i'm not sure that phil is going to be able to answer um but if you'd like to go first with one of one of yours and then, and then the other person was uh, jill kingaby who i think i've seen as well on the screen somewhere but robin if you'd like to start Certainly. Thank you very much indeed, Dave. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, um, 
I'm going to, I'm referring not only to what you have said, Phil, but also um, to the key route network map, which was issued with the agenda. And I noticed that um, uh, the Queen Square, which is on the Bath to um, Bristol uh, corridor, though rather closer into Bath than anything else, it, it's the heart of Georgian Bath, and yet it still seems to be on a key route in direct contravention of Baines's adopted policy to reduce intrusion of traffic into the historic core. <clears throat> Though surely it ought to be undesignated. This should not be a key route. That, that's uh, the, the uh, Queen Square section I should stress is not, it's not something we've made a decision on. As far as the key route goes, uh, Claire, I'm not sure whether you can help me with this one um, at your end. Um, Apologies to uh, bring you in at that point. Um, it's just that I'm I'm not I'm not clear what the the, the that paper that was shared and what what it referred to. I can't hear you, Claire. No, there's no sign there, Claire. The only thing I will, the only thing I will, I, I will add while Claire's trying to sort itself out, Robin, is one of my other projects we're going to be looking at is um, Central Bath and how we, especially how do we improve access to the bus station for buses, but how do we look at the provision of better access for sustainable transport? That's a, a later project that's going to be coming down the line. So I'm just wondering if that one actually might be possibly more relevant for something to pick up for that one. Okay. Claire's, uh, Claire's come back. So um, um, Gary Peacock in uh, transport will be able to answer that one for you, Robin. So um, we'll Mark and I will forward that that question on to to Gary. If I can just get um, uh, Jill Kingaby's question in now, and then I'll come back to you, Robin, for your second one. Jill, are you are you there? I can see that uh, you're on the screen, but I haven't got any um, I haven't got any picture. Have you got Have you got your question, or would you like me to answer it for ask ask for you? Can you hear me? Yeah, no, yes. we hear you, Jill. Yes, I'm sorry. I think I have a problem with um, with with the visibility. Um, but uh, um, no, my question was: um, Can you reassure us that there's going to be an all-rounded approach um, to considering the rail services between Bath and Bristol, as well as improved, um, hopefully improved uh, bus and cycling? Um, facilities um is weka taking that all-round approach uh yeah absolutely i i i'm I, it's not part of this project directly um i'm i'm the public transport program manager but there is one of my colleagues as the rail program manager um so she she will be picking up that and i know that they are looking at different elements uh, along that connection between bristol and bath and, and the wider network as well um, but that's uh, yeah, it is. Uh, it, it's not directly part of this project, so um, it, I, I, it was not something I will be dealing with. Obviously, rail and highways are significantly different and have different delivery timescales and different delivery issues. But yes, yes, Jill, it, it, it is something that will be looked at. Okay, thank you. Brilliant. Um, there was a question that was submitted by Peter Fellows, I, who I see is is here. But again, Peter, yours was about Cleveland Bridge um, in particular, wasn't it? Yes, uh, thank you, Dave. Um, my question is an age-old question concerning the Cleveland Bridge. I live on the um, I live in Bathwick Street, which is in the cor direct corridor to Cleveland Bridge, which at the moment is closed for twelve weeks for repairs and renovation. The problem with Cleveland Bridge is traffic, HGV traffic from Poole Harbour going north to the M4 and along the M4 and then through to the M5, through to the M6, to the north of England, to the Midlands and the north of England. This traffic, HGV traffic, doesn't belong in Bath, but whichever avenue I pursue, as if I'm engaging in the elephant in the room, nobody wants to take the matter to get the A36 deregulated as an a as an a, a roadway across Bath. Mm. Now at the moment it's coming through designated grade two listed buildings in Bathwick Street, 
and it's causing a big, big problem for residents hear about. I re really need reassurance that WECA, now they're taking over, I believe to be the funding through, with, through National Highways for the development of the road structure. I'm hoping that WECA mm. will help us. Peter, uh, the specific, Peter, the specific of your question, which was about Will, will 48, 48 ton articulated lorries be permitted? Yes, that's correct. Bridge? We're yeah. not going to be able to answer that tonight, but we will take your question uh, and we will pass that on to the cabinet member responsible and we'll make sure that you do get a, a response. Now, I've got Claire Cornelius has got her hand up and I've also got Michael Ash who's put a question in on the chat. Claire, if you'd like to just say what you've got to say first and then Michael will go to you if that's okay. Thanks, Dave. Can can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. yeah Brilliant. Fine. Okay, so um, we'll take the question away about Cleveland Bridge. I just wanted to make the group aware that um, Baines, Dorset, Wiltshire, um, Poole, we've all been working together to try and address the north-south connectivity issue that's been described and how that results in HGVs driving through our city. Um, and what, we, what we've managed to achieve is in the road infrastructure in the road investment strategy, the Highways England road investment strategy, we've managed to convince government to mandate Highways England um, to undertake um, a feasibility study on how they might solve this issue. Um, because of course it is uh, part of the strategic road network. So um, it, it requires Highways England to undertake it rather than ourselves. So just by information, I just wanted to let you know that Highways England are working on that. Um, I know it's a live project for them because I've attended um, an initial workshop and that's reporting through the Western Gateway um, Transport Board. Um, I don't have any further information to give at this point because they haven't come back with any initial findings or thoughts. But I just wanted to reassure you that um, Baines as a council has done its part with the other councils in getting that mandated to be looked at. We'll come back to you on the Cleveland Bridge issue then. Yeah, smashing, Claire. Thanks ever so much. Uh, Michael, did you want to ask your question? And I, I know, Karis, you've got your hand up. I've seen you. Hi, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, lovely. Yeah, I, um, my question was to what extent do tram, trams, tramways feature in all of this and the considerations? And just a bit of context. I live in Bath, sort of on the north side. Um, I'm retired now, so I don't travel a great deal to Bristol. In fact, actually avoid traveling to Bristol because it's an absolute pain, which, whichever way you want to go. So I'd like to go a lot more, um, but I'd, I'd just avoid it. I speak uh, from, the, from the background of formerly being in an area in uh, actually southeast of London, sort of uh, where there was quite substantial tramway infrastructure introduced this is in the Beckenham, Croydon, Wimbledon connections, Addington, um, over a period of years. And I would just say that's made me an absolute enthusiast for trams. I would not use my car if there were trams available. It's as simple as that. Um, the, the, thanks, thanks, Michael. I think I think from um, something I, sh I should have front-ended at this um, part of this um, presentation was that there is obviously a mass transit project that has been looked at for the West of England. Um, the A4 corridor is something that is being looked at. Um, what we are, we, we're clear what we're doing is a short term quick win delivery um, because oh, the mass okay. transit project is unlikely to be coming forward for several years due to costs likely to be. What we are aspiring to do is build the infrastructure to make it a lot easier to put something like trams, if that was the solution, on, onto, onto, the, onto the A4 corridor. But that, that project is a long way away from making those decisions and they're hoping to go out to do some engagement later this year. So you, you will have an opportunity, hopefully, Michael, to uh, input into that um, that vision and their, their very early days uh, of that as well. So probably a good time to grab them now. OK, all right. Separate, well, separate well, issue. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, I'm conscious of time. I've got three people who have uh, got some uh, question they'd like to ask. If I can ask you that you keep it short and to the point. Uh, and then we can hopefully stick to the agenda and move on. So it will be Keris and then I think Frank Thompson and then Paul Jackson. So Keris first, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to take up uh, Claire's comment about the strategic review and um, on the tone scale of that, looking at there is um, at least a decade or so before anything would be done. 
Um, and so nobody thinking about um, removing traffic from Queen Square until we can do something that does actually reduce the traffic in Bath, um, because otherwise you're just shifting the deck chair and the Titanic from one Georgian area of Bath um, to another Georgian area of Bath. And um, I'd just like to point out that in one of the first slides, um, the notable by it absence was anything, any connection with the um, east of Bath, although you had connections with other areas. And I'd just like to reinforce what other people have said. There needs to be a solution there, because otherwise there will be no solution um, for central Bath. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. I, I, I'm happy to ask, answer the question. Clear, you might, I'm not sure, clear whether you want to come in and talk about the um, the, the strategy. But um, as far as the, the Easter Bath is on the programme, it's later on the programme. We, we unfortunately only have limited resources and limited budget, so we had to focus our priorities. But we will be looking more widely at Bath um, later in the programme. And I say later in the programme, I, I'm sticking a finger in the air a little bit here, but um, it, it's likely to be not i'm not talking four or five years away i'm talking two three years away max a um, couple of years away max so i'm a, i've put 23 down as a bit of finger in the air for east of bath and um when we hopefully have got over the uh the, the bump in the road of, of getting this one up and running so we will be looking at addressing um wider uh, issues in bath uh, later in the program yeah. thank you thank you uh frank Um, hi. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I, I put my, my, my question in the chat and I didn't realise I would uh, get the, um, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to speak live. So thank you very much for that. No, no, um, no, no. This is a very inclusive forum. <laughs> um, it, I, I, uh, Phil, I, th uh, this may be a too detailed question, I don't know. But the, um, the active travel proposal put forward by Baines Council for the Upper Bristol Road in Bath um, includes uh, provision for temporary, certain elements of temporary parking. Now, we all know the reality is that the police will not enforce uh, any um, conservation of, of, of temporary parking. And people park, you know, people will park there for, for, for hours on end. Um, is there any, uh, anything within the, uh, the proposals and the work that you're taking forward um, to ensure that um, <clears throat> either on an active travel front or on uh, your WECA front, that um, <clears throat> parking, uh, temporary parking enforcement uh, will be addressed? I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you're probably right. The easy answer, to Frank, is we're, we're too early to, to, to say that at this moment. Um, but that's actually, for me, a classic example of where your input would be useful. To, 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 to So please do make the comments and get, yeah. get those back to us. That'd be, that'd be helpful for us to uh, make sure we've got that documented. Splendid. Right, I've got one more question, and then I'm, we're going to move on, I think, on the agenda. So it was Paul Jackson. Paul? Right, well, thank you. Um, my, my question is really just supporting Ian, uh, sorry, Robin on Queen Square. Um, you know, I, I asked the question, what other World Heritage sites have major roads driven through the middle of them? Um, and just picking up on that, um, I, I know you're working with um, Transport England about deregulating A roads and seeking alternatives. But what, what um, weight do they put on World Heritage Sites? I mean, I do think this is something that is absolutely unique about Bath. And yet I, have, I hear nothing about Baines pressing this point, either publicly or to transport, uh, to, to transport England. And I think it, it, it's what makes Bath unique. And I, so my question is, is this point being made to them that that's what makes Bath a special case? Um, if I jump in on on that one, um, I am not aware that we've specifically made the point that we are a special case in regards to our um, heritage status and our new status as well with great spa cities of Europe, which is another feather to our cap. But I can assure you, I suppose I can give you the reassurance that next time I speak to Highways England, I will, I will make that point to them so that it's explicit. Um, 
if you would like, I could point you to um, some web pages where we've put some information up about um, the case we've been making to date, um, so that you can see that the work we've done so far in um, preparing Highways England to take on this case for us. Okay, thanks. I, I, I just think that if you don't include it, you're, you're kind of missing a trip. This is all part of a, a, a wider consultation process and you will be coming back I've no doubt to uh, to this group in the future. Is that right, Philip? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There will be there will be further chance to input. This is not a done deal um, or anything like that. This is just getting that early input at this stage, yeah. um, and that and that process will continue. Um, it, it's yeah. We we have to we have to set deadlines. We have to set timescales. Otherwise, we just continually evolving. We have to close down certain sections at one point. But this there will be yeah. Say the next stage will be starting to look at design work. So there'll be further chance to input um, later on as well. Um, in 2022 so um, and th thank you Phil and what we will be doing just so everybody knows is obviously we will be circulating uh, providing links to supporting information and also about the consultation Mark will send that all out to you tomorrow so we want to get you engaged in the process right at the very start and take you all the way through it but this isn't your only chance to get a look at when when some of the details starts to get um, uh, fixed up you'll get a chance to have a look at that again um, I think that's splendid uh, Phil Claire, thank you ever so much for coming uh, this evening and thank you for that presentation. Uh, and we look forward to seeing what comes out as a result of, uh, of your consultation work when you come back to us. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. No, thank no, you. Brilliant. You're welcome. I, I think I'll stick around for the local plan partial update in SPDs just in case there's any transport related questions to that, I if you don't they, mind, Dave. No, no, that's fine, Claire. I think they, I think they might well be. So thank item you. three, which is the local plan partial update, including the supplementary planning document consultation. Uh, and I'm delighted to uh, to welcome one of my colleagues, Richard Dayon, who's ah, there he is in the top left hand corner of my screen. Richard, nice to see you. Thank you ever so much for coming. Same format as before. 15, a little presentation, 15 minutes, 10 minutes worth of questions, uh, and then we can move on to the next item at seven o'clock. So that would be brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And um, well, thank you. Thank, good evening, everybody. And thank you again for the opportunity to, to just brief you, uh, hopefully succinctly on, on the sort of key planning policy consultations that, that are happening now. Um, before I start the presentation, just a brief reminder for those that, that might not know, I guess, um, that in the UK, we, we, uh, we have something that's called a plan led system. So that means any planning applications for new development must be determined in accordance with what's called the development plan or, or the local plan. Uh, and that's why it's important that we have uh, an up to date planning policy framework uh, so that those decisions, uh, you know, achieve what the council and, and what its communities and residents uh, want to achieve. The local plan is also supported by a range of supplementary documents, which provide further detail on, on specific policy areas. And again, I'll come on to that in a moment. So next slide, please, Mark. So we're currently undertaking a consultation uh, from now really th right through to the uh, 8th of October on four documents. So they're listed there. So it's local plan partial update, and three supplementary planning documents on uh, retrofitting, retrofitting uh, and sustainable construction, transport and development, and houses in multiple occupation. So I'll take you through very briefly uh, some of the key aspects of those, of those documents. Um, next slide, please, Mark. So as the name suggests, it's a, it's a partial update of the local plan. So, so we're just updating specific parts of the local plan to address uh, urgent issues within uh, Bath, North East Somerset. I should say here that the plan does cover the whole of the district. Um, obviously, it's, there are particular issues that are relevant to Bath that I'll come on to. So it's four main areas really of, of uh, change or issues that we're addressing. Firstly, uh, to ensure our policies help better address the climate emergency. That, so that includes uh, things around uh, policies relating to and requiring zero carbon construction. Also helping to facilitate uh, renewable energy installations to come forward uh, in the right parts of the district and, and of the appropriate scale, particularly taking account of uh, landscape sensitivity and landscape potential. And that's particularly important uh, within, obviously on the edge of uh, Bath. 
and then a whole series of policies relating to and uh, encouraging the use of sustainable modes of, of transport. So obviously walking, cycling and, and, and public transport. The next area is to uh, change or amend policies so that they better address the ecological emergency. So that's strengthening existing policies that already protect uh, key um, um, uh, irreplaceable habitats and species. So it's strengthening those policies, but also we're looking to bring forward a, a policy that seeks to uh, ensure developers deliver something called biodiversity net gain. So rather than, as it, when a development uh, comes forward, rather than simply protecting existing uh, nature conservation interests on the site, they have to go further than that. They actually have to deliver improvements uh, and what's called a net gain in terms of biodiversity. The next area that's being addressed is, is addressing a housing supply shortfall. So latest information shows that we're gonna struggle to meet our housing requirement. Uh, and so therefore we need to identify some additional sites to uh, address that problem. And, and, and in doing that, that will mean we then are better able to control where and when housing development comes forward and that we're not so vulnerable, if you like, to predatory uh, planning applications. And the final area is, is green recovery. So uh, economic recovery, uh, you know, and, and trying to facilitate that post COVID. That includes the Summer Valley Enterprise Zone, but it also includes some key uh, sites in Bath that I'll come on to in a moment. Next slide, please, Mark. So in terms of uh, the key implications for Bath, I've, I've mentioned housing supply, so I'll come back to that in a, in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, green recovery. So there's two major sort of policy area changes there. We're looking to provide stronger protection for existing industrial sites within the city. As many of you will be aware, we've lost a lot of industrial land and employment land in the city, particularly to things like purpose-built student accommodation, but also other residential uses, really because they're, they're, they're higher value. So we're trying to hold on to the existing sites that we've got uh, better. We're also um, promoting two uh, new opportunities. The first is a, a Locksbrook Creative Industry Hub. So that's working in partnership with the Bar Spa University to provide uh, accommodation that, that, that both provides teaching space, but also provides uh, workshop space for creative industries. Uh, and then Western Ireland, um, again, we're looking to bring that site forward for potentially employment uses, really to help actually relocate employment uses from, from some other sites closer to the city centre so that those sites can be then redeveloped uh, for more appropriate and higher density uses, including uh, housing. Uh, then, the, then the last two areas really are relating to uh, purpose-built student accommodation policy changes uh, and uh, houses in multiple occupation and in relation to sustainable transport. I'll come on to those in a moment as well. Next slide, please, Mark. So in terms of housing supply, um, we're both allocating some new sites, but also amending uh, the policies for some existing sites. So the main sites in Bath are, are listed there. So Twerton Park, um, in order to help fund improvements to the football club and, and to provide some residential accommodation, we are that, that site is already allocated for development, but, but that policy we're looking to enable Higher, for, higher density forms of residential accommodation. So possibly things like uh, co-living uh, and, and, uh, and more affordable flats, but specifically excluding purpose-built student accommodation. So we wouldn't be allowing uh, student accommodation on that site. Um, Bath Riverside or Bath Western Riverside as it, as it was known, um, again, amending the policy just to set out more clearly the quality of place that we want created there. Uh, to strengthen the green infrastructure requirements, uh, the green infrastructure that's created, particularly close to the river corridor, and also increasing the housing capacity of that, that site. And then there's two new significant allocations. Uh, one at St Martin's Hospital, so that is releasing part of the St Martin's Hospital site for residential development, but not the part of the site that is uh, needed to continue providing clinical uh, care services. Uh, and uh, the Cyan Hill site, currently owned by 
basketball university so as part of their um, reorganization they're seeking to release that site for residential development um, so that that is also related to the locksbrook creative industry hub that i referred to earlier next slide please mark in terms of sustainable transport um, as i've already said we're looking to strengthen the focus on sustainable travel so particularly in relation to new development making sure that the needs of walking cycling and public transport are considered before uh, we look at uh, the, the the needs or requirements of uh, private cars um, in terms of the park and ride sites there's that they, they will play an important role in terms of uh, sustainable travel so currently they are just park and ride sites so people are obviously driving you know to the city will park there and then get a bus into the city what the council is looking to do is to really change those into uh, multimodal transport interchange hubs so that people both driving into the city but also people uh, wanting to access the countryside around the city that they can change to a whole range of different travel modes so that could be that could be bikes so there could be secure cyber parking and perhaps changing facilities there there could be charging for uh, electric bikes because they're potentially i think a you know a game changer they, there would be the potential to change to other micro mobility modes so things like e-scooters etc now in order to um, create those transport interchange hubs that requires some development that really would be very difficult to bring forward uh, within the green belt because the, the park and ride sites at the moment are all located within the green belt so what we're proposing through the partial update is to remove those sites from the green belt to enable them to become uh, transport interchange uh, hubs next slide please mark um, so in terms of purpose-built student accommodation and, and uh, housing multiple occupation or hmos um, we're trying to i suppose set out a strategy of greater control in terms of purpose-built uh, accommodation whereby that is focused uh, on campus um, and particularly on the university of bath campus where there is more scope to provide um, student accommodation and to try and prevent or, or, or at least slow down the proposals for speculative student accommodation with elsewhere within the city. Um, so elsewhere off campus, they would have they would need to they would need to show that there was a need for that student accommodation through uh, a nomination agreement with one of the universities. Um, in terms of housing multiple occupation, currently the the, the policies are really focused on the change of use from a dwelling house to uh, to an HMO. What we're looking to do is it, it extend the scope of those policies so that they also cover the change of use to an HMO from other uses such as, I don't know, a pub or, or a shop, uh, that, it, that those policies also cover intensification. So that's changing from a, a small HMO to a, to a larger HMO and that the policies also cover look to cover new build HMOs and there are proposals or there have been proposals coming forward for those in addition to trying to control uh, the concentration and the spread of HMOs across the city we're also looking to address the standard of accommodation um, in terms of for example its energy performance rating uh, and in terms of other quality aspects like minimum room, room sizes noise noise reduction, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. So conscious of the time, just to say in terms of the, the partial update, that's setting out the, the stages through which the plan has gone. We've already consulted on uh, a launch document and options, whereby we got wide ranging views from the community and we fed those views from the community into preparing the draft plan. So having consulted on options, we're now at a formal stage of consultation. So the comments that, that, that come in uh, have to focus on something uh, what's called whether the plan is, is sound or not. And if people think it isn't sound, what changes to the plan they would like. Those comments, of course, are considered by the council, but we're at a formal stage. So what happens then to those comments is they are then forwarded to the planning inspector for examination uh, later in the year before we can adopt the plan, um, hopefully next year. Next slide, please, Mark. Just very briefly on the on these uh, SPDs, the supplementary documents. So the Houses of Multiple Occupation or HMO SPD, 
Um, as many of you will be aware, that sets out the criteria by which we seek to manage the, the growth and distribution of HMOs. Uh, and we've reviewed a number of aspects of that. So we've, re we've reviewed the approach to the concentration threshold uh, and 10% will be, if you like, the tipping point. So if an application for a new HMO was in an area uh, 100 meters from uh, the property, if, 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 if that application was, was in an area where the current threat, where the current proportion of HMOs was, let's say, 9.7%, and it took it, in, and that application would take it to over 10%, then we would be looking as a council to refuse uh, that application. We've also um, reviewed and are extending the uh, sandwich test. So this is where if the creation uh, of an HMO would res result in uh, a, a, a family home or family dwelling being sandwiched by HMOs, then, then again, that would be refused. And we have, we've now extended that to cover, if you like, vertical, vertical sandwiching or, or flats, where that increasingly is an issue. And again, link back to the partial update we're addressing uh, issues around the, the, the standard of uh, accommodation as well. So more detail on that in the SPD. So next slide, please. Um, energy efficiency and uh, retrofitting um, SPD. At the moment, we've got two SPDs, a separate one on sustainable construction and retrofitting, and then uh, another one uh, specifically rated to listed and uh, undesignated historic buildings. We're looking to combine those SPDs to provide one, one set of clear, positive guidance uh, for homeowners and occupiers as to what measures they can implement in their property to achieve greater energy efficiency. And that, that SPD is also updated in terms of um, updated technological information and improved uh, illustrations. And we've got a section in there on uh, affordable warmth uh, as, as well. So next slide, please, Mark. So I'm whistling through this now. Transport and Development um, SPD um, addresses a series of issues, four main sections. Firstly, on uh, parking provision associated with new development. So the parking standards for development are currently set in the uh, local plan. We're looking to move those to an SPD to give us a bit more flexibility in terms of keeping those under review. And those standards are, are being uh, revised, you know, to accord more closely with, again, the climate emergency. Um, related to the parking standards, the SPD also covers uh, the standard for and, and design of um, ultra low emission vehicle charging uh, points uh, and infrastructure for new development. We've talked about water and cycling infrastructure and the importance of making sure that that is accessible, uh, comfortable and secure. Uh, to use. So uh, we were setting out more design on that through the SPD. And then the final element relates to travel plans uh, guidance, which again really is about encouraging uh, modal shift to, to public transport, walking and cycling for large development schemes uh, and requiring developers to provide uh, or prepare that travel plan. Uh, uh, travel plan. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. This is the last one you'll be pleased to know. So just a reminder, consultation period uh, finishes on the 8th of October. Um, so please do make sure you get your comments to us and do encourage, um, you know, residents in your area to also get involved. The best way to, to respond really is through uh, online. We've got a response portal and, and questionnaire online relating to the local plan and to the SVDs. It should be relatively easy to use. If it isn't, please do get in touch with us. However, those who haven't got a computer, obviously we will accept um, paper copy um, comments. Just to flag up, um, there are a, a series of, of webinars on specific topics. A, a lot of them have actually taken place already, but there are, there are still a couple, I think, to, to come next week. So keep an eye out for those. Um, I should have included in the consultation a link to the website where all of the documentation is available, but I'm sure, Dave, we can circulate that uh, after the meeting to uh, to, to attendees. Um, happy to take any questions uh, arising from that. Appreciate it was a bit whistle whistle stop to or through it through quite a wide range of issues, but happy to take any questions. Yeah, Richard, uh, thank you. That's uh, that's really interesting. You're right. There's an awful lot in there to 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 go through, and I would encourage people to 
they get an opportunity to go on the website and have a look at some of the information in a bit more detail because the responses need to be in by the 8th of um, October. I've got um, a couple of people that have uh, got questions in. I've got Joel Hurst, who's first, and then Malcolm Baldwin. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you, uh, Richard, for, for that uh, uh, whip through. I, th I think there's lots to be uh, celebrated in, in, in the proposals, but I wanted to ask specifically about key development sites and two in particular. So I'm looking for reassurance that Sulis Down is not a key development site and that there's recognition that the 171 houses that are just, they've started putting the spades in the ground, I think this month, that, that, that we're not looking at expanding any more housing on that site beyond the 171 houses because of the pressure on the road infrastructure. And then the second question was about the, the, uh, the key development site at St. Martin's and whether there's an opportunity to uh, protect the uh, pauper's burial ground on that site and to take out Froome House as part of that development and do the development so that it doesn't impact on the pauper's burial ground. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joel. Um, so in terms of um, Sulis Down, I can provide some reassurance, but probably not, not necessarily quite the reassurance you're, you're after. So the site uh, was previously removed from the Greenbelt and uh, allocated for around 300 homes uh, in the core strategy. We're not proposing um, to change that site allocation through the partial update. That's really because you know, the site allocation has previously gone through an examination and a planning inspector, you know, agreed it was it was evidence based. Uh, it was an appropriate uh, site for development. So what we're not proposing through the partial update is to change or extend that that allocation. So no further development over and above that, which was in the core strategy site. But as I say, that's not just the 171. It's it's allocated for around 300. So. 171 has got planning permission now. I think I'm writing saying either a planning application has been submitted or we're expecting one very shortly for the remaining 129. Um, but after that, um, basically no further development is, 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 is proposed. Um, in terms of St Martins, yes, the policy requires that um, assessment is undertaken and those heritage assets, if you like, are, are properly respected. So in terms of the uh, pauper's burial ground, yes, that can be, that can be avoided. What we're, what we're principally talking about is developing or delivering around 50 homes, but through conversion of or redevelopment of the current built footprint. So the, so the, so the, so the graveyard would remain, the burial ground would remain uh, undisturbed. And in terms of Froome House, you know, I think that again, through a planning application, we'd have to look at is that better converted or is it better demolished and redeveloped? Um, yeah, so hopefully that gives you enough reassurance. Thank you, thank you. Malcolm and then Nicolette and then Paul Jackson. Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, Richard, um, two questions really, if I may. Forgive my throat, I've got a very bad throat, so I'm a bit croaky. Um, We've got a piece of land, which is the cattle market, which is really, I presume, categorized potentially as brown field site, which is just a general car park at the moment. My first question is in relation to that. That is probably the last opportunity we've got in bars to actually open up for the general public some sort of amenity facility to the river. Could you give us any reassurance at the moment that there are no development plans in hand for building on that in terms of um, potential accommodation or housing. Um, that's question one, because um, I think that would be a great yeah. loss for the city, even though it's a small area, if we miss the opportunity to reopen something else to the river. And I yeah. still have a, a little bit of a twinkle in my eye about the um, corn exchange itself, maybe being a long term site for the fashion museum. But, um, you know, so wouldn't want to lose the opportunity yeah, yeah. to link those two things together. My second question is, obviously there's a lot of different initiatives and very good initiatives going on with this particular council. That's not a party political point, it's a general point. Um, low traffic neighborhoods um, are interesting. And can you give us a reassurance that there's some joined up thinking going on here? Because plucking out um, the university up in Zion Hill Place, as an example, um, Areas surrounding that towards what might be classified as mid or upper lands down 
are under consideration for potential LTNs. Access for a major construction project there, which undoubtedly that will be, are only, if I recollect, Zion Road, Lansdowne Crescent, and Cavendish Road. Um, nothing can come from the other direction. And therefore, when that's being looked at, depending on when that development is going to start, are people giving some attention to the fact that um, discussions about LTNs are also going on? Because I would have thought the residents, it doesn't include me, the residents of Lansdowne Crescent, Cavendish Road and Zion Road, for example, would have some alarming concerns about the amount of heavy construction traffic that's going to occur there at a moment in time. Thank you, um, Malcolm. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of your first question, um, relating to the cattle market site, that, that site, including actually the corn market building as well, that's already allocated for um, development in the uh, current plan um, to include, uh, you know, a mix of uses, potentially some residential, potentially uh, other town centre uses like retail, etc. However, what I would say in that policy is, is there is a requirement that access to the river is is opened up and is provided because I agree with you that is one that is a key opportunity for opening up and, and, and improving access to the river to the riverside and the river corridor in, in that part of the city. So that is part of the development requirements. We are reviewing um, that site allocation through the partial update, but principally um, to try and facilitate um, the potential for some meanwhile uses, I don't know, temporary uses like market stalls and, or something like that, just in the short term to help try and create um, some vibrancy in that part of the uh, city centre. And that's part of uh, or related to another pro project uh, called the Milsom Quarter Master Plan, which is, yep. again, looking at that, that area and trying to, sure. to, to reinvigorate it. Um, in terms of the second question, um, Sion Hill, yeah, I mean, it's allocated for, or it's proposed to be allocated for development. Clearly, once that site is developed, uh, the, you know, the development there would need to be consistent with the principles of uh, a low traffic neighbourhood. Uh, and it would be, you know, a site, again, that would be very much encouraging walking and cycling, public transport, etc. In terms of the construction traffic, uh, I mean, that's a, I suppose that's a temporary, you know, that is a temporary issue while construction is, is ongoing. And that's something we would need to review, I suppose, and negotiate with the developer and also, you know, the phasing for introducing low, low traffic neighbours. I don't know whether, whether Claire is still on the line or not and whether she might want to um, add to that answer. I am on the line, Richard, and it's a difficult question to answer because it is, it's, not, it's not a very significant consideration or material consideration at the planning stage it like you say it's a temporary thing so we try to manage it as best we can through timing restrictions and construction management plans and we don't necessarily always have that detail up front to accompany the planning application um, it is something we do and we work with our colleagues in street works and traffic and safety to try and get the right balance between getting the development finished as soon as possible versus um, not overloading the community with impact. Um, it's probably about as much as I can say without um, having knowledge of the detail of any application. Okay, thank you, Claire. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question from Nicolette and then a couple of points from Paul Neary. And then if everybody's happy, then I'm proposing that we move on. So Nicolette. Yes, I was wondering um, whether there were any changes in the, the partial update to um, regarding electrical, sorry, electric vehicle charging um, facilities. And if so, or just a general update on what provision there is and where and, um, and for whom. When I say for whom, I was just thinking, uh, will there be any priority, for instance, given to um, car share vehicles rather than privately owned vehicles. Um, and also particularly interested in where, where we've got uh, um, densely populated terrace, street, terrace streets of housing where there's no off street parking, whether there's going to be any communal facilities for charging electrical vehicles. 
Yeah, thank, thanks. Um, good question, Nicola. Um, the local plan and, and planning policy um, only relates to proposals for new development or, or you know, and also conversions of, of properties, really. But um, so what it, what it will require is where a, a proposal for new development uh, you know, does require parking provision, that it should also, uh, it should also provide uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure as well. So what, it, what the plan doesn't address, I suppose, is the um, provision of, of public um, charging infrastructure. You know, quite often, actually, the, the provision of charging infrastructure uh, uh, on, on street wouldn't require planning permission anyway. Um, but again, I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm glad Claire's still on the line because I will defer to Claire here as well. She may be able to give an update on um, some of the other areas of work the council is progressing in terms of uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Thanks, Richard. So um, we did produce a report looking at that issue of um, on street parking and how you get safe connections to it. It was quite a high level uh, strategy when we're looking at the supplementary planning document though we have upped our game in terms of electric vehicle provision so we've we've got provision in there for 100 percent passive and we specified the exact um, technical um, requirements of that in terms of um, putting in ducting and charging and rate of charging and things like that so it does go into quite a lot of detail about it in the supplementary planning document um, so I would encourage you to read that part. Um, it's relatively easy to navigate. So at the top of the document where you have the sort of index, if you just press on the press on the bit that you want to look at, it'll automatically navigate you to that part of the document. Um, I'm just looking at it now in the ultra low emission vehicle section starts at page 104. Um, we do cover quite a lot within it, but we have upped our game is the answer. Um, but as Richard said, it, it does relate only to developments that require planning permission. Um, so we haven't cracked that nut yet on how we get um, on street charging within the public highway. Thank you, Claire. That's very helpful. Uh, and then finally, Paul, Paul Neary, you've got a couple of things, one about student accommodation and then one about measurement of capacity within the city for business office and retail space. Do you want, do you want to ask? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was interested in the um, situation regarding the uh, private student accommodation, and you're kind of saying that you were hoping to limit that, but without the influence of the university and the input of the university, I don't understand how you could do that. So what, what's the motivation for the university to cap the student places? So yeah, we are working with and in, in close discussion um, with the universities on, on our policy approach. Um, I mean, they've, they've both got slightly different strategies. If I start with Bath Bar University, they are looking to um, increase student numbers, but at a relatively low rate. The other important point to note with Bath Bar University is actually the proportion of students that require uh, student accommodation is relatively low, it's, it's below 50%. So what Basketball University are seeking to do is, is to, um, in effect, reorganize their estate um, in order to provide, again, more student accommodation uh, on, their, on, on, on their land ownership, on, on their campus and, and on other sites. Uh, and they're aiming, if you like, at a strategy whereby it's a, a, a walkable campus as well, so that students can live within walking distance to the teaching space. So again, our, our policy approach is, is very much supporting it and is in, in line with their strategy. And in, in terms of the University of Bath, their approach is now not focused on uh, growing student numbers. It's, it's focused on improving the student experience. And, you know, they have agreed with, with the council uh, and, and freely admit that sometimes um, you know, accommodation that's provided to students is, is not a good experience and is an expensive experience in Bath. So they are looking, again, to provide more university managed uh, accommodation, particularly on campus. So again, we've been in discussion with them uh, and the approach that the 
partial update is taking is is trying to identify those areas within the campus where development would be acceptable uh, and you know again the work that's been progressed shows that 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 would be sufficient uh, to not only meet uh, well yeah to, to more than meet the needs of of the university in terms of its current um, student base which you know in theory should actually help release uh, or could help release uh, some properties that are currently used as student HMOs either to be used as HMOs for uh, professional people and we have to remember HMOs aren't just occupied by students or it could or, or some of those properties could revert back to um, becoming family homes again so the point is they would be a housing um, part of the non-student uh, resident population of the city so I hope that answers your question Paul. Sure, sure. Well, and, sorry, sorry, the, second one. Yeah. sure. The, the second one was just uh, in and around the um, floor space, the business office retail space has within Bath. Um, do you track that? Is there some kind of index to show historically whether we've gained, lost that space within the city? Yeah, yes, we, yes, we do monitor it. Um, and if you're happy to give Dave, your um, contact sure. details, I can email you a link to our monitoring report, which, which sets out information on uh, gains and losses of different types of employment space, whether that's industrial space, office space, uh, retail space, etc. You say, yes, we do monitor it. And what that's showing is um, the industrial space, as I think, as I said, uh, the losses of industrial space are, are, are running significantly above what we were um, seeking to achieve. And in terms of office space uh, we were planning or are planning for a growth in office space or net increase in office space um, up to 2029 uh, and what that monitoring shows at the moment is is that um, the, 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 the increase is significantly below uh, where it should be at this point in in terms of uh, meeting demand and that's principally because for two reasons one there's been greater loss than we wanted but also some of the key development sites, in particular uh, the Bath Keys sites, so Bath Keys South and Bath Keys North, that they have not yet um, been delivered. Those are both coming forward and they will deliver significant amounts of new purpose-built um, office floor space in the city. Super, thank you. Splendid, Richard, thank you. Right, I've got um, one, one person, sorry, Paul Jackson, I, I, I missed you, you had a couple of questions. One about um, Airbnb, uh, and then obviously something again about uh, University of Bath reducing its accommodation for its students on site. So do you want to ask those very quickly? Because uh, again, I'm conscious of time. It's 10 past seven. OK, thanks. Um, yeah, just on the, the last point, it was just a quick point, because in the previous local plan, there was a requirement on the University of Bath to have student accommodation for 2000 people. And when I looked at the revised plan, they were trying to get it reduced to 750. Um, and I know that they converted some of that existing student accommodation for other uses. So my question was really, what's the number that they've got in the local plan now? Is it going down to 750 or is this being resisted? That was my first question. Shall I ask my second one as well? If you wish, yep. Yeah. yeah, okay. My second one um, is more, more linked to HMOs, which as I understand it is when there's shared accommodation and people are sharing the same kitchen and or bathroom facilities. And yet, and, and, and that's linked to the building of new properties because of the, as you said, there's a housing shortage. Um, yes, at the same time, we're losing properties because they're being used for things like Airbnb, where whole houses are being taken out of the market, um, rental or, or, or um, um, ownership, and, and, can, and do, just used for holiday lets. And yet there seems to be nothing in the local plan that controls that, that... Um, that licenses that use for holiday lets. Um, and it seems to me that's a, a loss. You, we, we got the housing, but it's being used for the wrong purposes. So I just wondered if that's something that could be factored in. Yep, so if I, I'll, take, I'll take the questions in the order you, you asked them. So in terms of the University of Bath, um, student accommodation is not being decreased to, to 750 on campus. I do apologize, I can't remember the, the precise figure that now is being planned for, but uh, there's additional uh, areas of student accommodation uh, identified uh, 
uh, on the uh, eastern side of the campus, but that would require um, some car parking to be displaced to the western side of, 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 of the campus. But we're, as a council, seeking to make sure that the overall level of parking on campuses is, is not increased, despite the fact, obviously, there's increased um, teaching uh, accommodation and student accommodation on site. We want to maintain the parking levels as they are now at, at worst or, or even better reduced. But I can, I can come back to you, Paul, again, if, if you leave contact details with Dave, I can come back to you um, with more information on the numbers. Um, the second question, yes, the loss of um, family properties or, or, or residential properties to holiday lets is an area of significant concern to the council. Um, it's, it's not currently um, something that is easily addressed by the planning system. And that's because as things stand, um, a short-term holiday let is the, is the same, what's called the same use class as a residential dwelling. In order for it to come under the remit of planning system, there has to be a, a change of use. Um, this council is amongst other councils lobbying hard uh, with the government to try and get them to, to change that. And I, I think we're gaining some, some traction on that. So subject to, you know, there being uh, a change nationally on that, then that is an issue that we will address through uh, the replacement or the new local plan work on which will start uh, early next year. And we've, we've already been doing quite a lot of research around um, the number of properties, both part properties and whole properties that are, as you say, being lost to short term holiday lets. And as I'm sure you're aware, you know, the, the trend is clearly upwards. So it is an increasing an increasing problem and, and one with, you know, as I say, we're we're well aware that we need to address uh, as soon as government enables us uh, to do so, if you like, and removes the, the sort of current shackles of the, of the planning system. Yeah, yeah, Richard. thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for some very, um, very interesting questions. Like, again, the consultation thing period, I think, finishes on the 8th of October. Uh, we would encourage you to put all of your ideas, suggestions and questions through um, through the uh, system, because then they will be considered by the planning inspector. Richard, thank you ever so much. If you want to leave us, that'd be, that, that, that's absolutely fine. We're going to talk about the marvellous issue now about street names for Bath Keys. Um, I'm not expecting you to come up with any particular <laughs> names right at this particular moment, but I can say that uh, Bridgie McBridge Face has already been uh, suggested, so I think that one's probably not going to happen. Um, but basically, Mark should show you some photographs now where we're talking about we need a name for the new bridge and we need a name for the road that's adjacent to it. What usually happens in parished areas outside of Bath is th this, these, these questions go to the local parish council and uh, uh, the parish councils and town councils decide what they want to call these roads. Obviously, as Bath doesn't have a city council or any local representation at that level before it used to go to the forum. So if anybody's got any ideas or names for those particular road that particular road that particular bridge then please feel free to just email them to mark and i and we will pass on uh, your suggestions they somebody's come up for a potential name for the bridge which is the bayer bridge because it was adjacent to the former uh, bayer corset factory that was there in bath on that particular site and the idea is is the bridge looks something like a corset make about what you will um but if anybody has got any ideas or suggestions, then please let Mark and I know. So we're getting close to the end, ladies and gentlemen. Um, item five, which is uh, any other business, the only item that I've got is obviously that we are looking for a chair and vice chair. It is, these forum meetings are far more better uh, chaired by a, a member of the public or somebody independent and certainly not a council officer. Um, I, I, I'm doing it and I would really rather hope that at our next meeting on the 1st of December, we may be in, uh, have an opportunity to um, have somebody come forward uh, as chair, somebody come forward as vice chair. We've got one or two people that are interested. If you are interested in what it entails and how much time it involves, then again, please talk to Mark and I, and we can let you know. Has anybody else got any other business? I'm conscious that it must be way past people's supper time because they're disappearing off the screen as I speak. No? Anybody else for anything else? Brilliant. The next meeting is 1st of uh, December, 6, 6 to 7.30 again, or earlier if we finish. 
but this will be a presentation and discussion on the council's budget setting process which we do every year with all the forums to give people an opportunity to input into their views about how they think the budget should be directed and where the money should be going so please put a date in your diary for that mark will circulate all the information uh, and you'll be able to register in advance so if there are no other comments or anything else that anybody wants to say can i thank you all very much for attending uh, i do hope you found it enjoyable and interesting please do take part in some of these consultations get your views across because we really do desperately need to know what you think brilliant in which case thank you ever so much everybody good night